Today we're going to talk about the fundamental interactions. We, we have some idea after chapter two that interactions change the momentum of, interactions with surrounding change the momentum of systems. We've characterized these interactions quantitatively as forces. But we want to say something, there's something more fundamental we can say about forces. Because it turns out that there are actually, as far as we can tell, and this is sort of one of the, the, the intellectual triumphs of physics and one of the things physicists even now are still working on, there are really only four fundamental kinds of interactions between all the kinds of matter we know about. And some of them are familiar to you and some of them aren't very familiar. So there's the gravitational interaction. or gravitational force. This is an extremely familiar one. You and all your belongings interact gravitationally with the Earth every day. And, but it, it's the case, and that's what we're going to spend today on, is the gravitational force, learning to calculate it in general. Um, anything that, any, any object that has mass interacts gravitationally with any other object. So, Planets and stars certainly interact gravitationally. Uh, the marker and the eraser are also interacting gravitationally. It's just that their mass uh, isn't very large. And compared to some other forces, this just turns out not to be a very macho force. Um, in fact, it takes the whole Earth to exert a gravitational force big enough to make the marker fall when I release it. So it's. it's there is, so anything that has mass interacts gravitationally, and it can be large or small. There's the electric interaction, or electromagnetic. Interaction. We won't say much about magnetism until next semester. Um, You've certainly heard about electric interactions from previous science courses. Anything that has a charge interacts electrically. Uh, and since all, all of us and everything in this room are made up of particles that have charges, positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons, then those charged particles are interacting electrically. That's why the electric Electrons stick around next to the nuclei because they're attracted to it electrically. Um, it also turns out that any contact interaction, so we've talked about springs. Uh, we've talked about the force the table exerts on the book. Anytime any ordinary matter is interacting, pushing against other ordinary matter, that's really an elect a, a combination of lots of electric interactions because it's the, pro the electron clouds of the atoms on the outside of this marker that start to interpenetrate the electron clouds of the atoms in my finger, and they repel. And so there are lots and lots and lots of charged particles interacting to make up these contact interactions that are so much a part of our, our daily lives. Um, there is, you may have heard of, so those two are pretty familiar. There's what we call the strong force, the strong interaction. This is, so this, any, any, any objects that are, any particles that are made up of quarks, which are little subatomic particles that have charges like plus two thirds or minus one third, interact through the strong interaction. So, uh, so any particles, that are made of quarks, they're called hadrons. And examples of particles that are made of quarks are protons and neutrons. Um, and there are other things, but these are the most common. What the strong interaction does that you may be familiar with is hold atomic nuclei together. 
Because in the nucleus of an atom, remember there are positively charged protons and then there are some neutrons that don't have any charge at all. But the problem with that is that these, these positively charged protons repel each other electrically. So they would actually, the nucleus would just want to fall apart. There's a very strong electric repulsion between like charged objects. So what holds atomic nuclei together? Well, it's the strong force, which uh, if, and, and that only kicks in when these particles really get close enough to touch each other. So the diameter of a proton or a neutron is about 10 to the minus 15th meters. These things have to be really just about touching before this force kicks in, and then it's very strong. It holds the nucleus together, even though all these protons don't like each other and would like to, to leave. So that's, that's a very strong interaction. And then there's another interaction called the weak interaction. Both things that are made of quarks and things that aren't made of quarks, things like electrons, which are called leptons or neutrinos, uh, interact through the weak interaction, but they indeed interact so weakly that for a long time no one knew it was there. It was hard to discover this interaction. Um, and so there, aren't, there, are, uh, there are some examples of this, and we might talk about one either at the end of this class or next time, things that, that involve the weak interaction. Um, but, uh, but these are harder to study. One of the things, so that's it. There are these four fundamental interactions. Now, one of the things physicists have been doing over the past 100 years or so is trying to figure out how to, it would be, it's satisfying to be able to classify every interaction that ever occurs as one of these four things, but it would be even more satisfying if you could say, well, it's really all one thing. We understand how all the pieces fit together. And so realizing that electric and magnetic interactions were related, that was a big step. Uh, then people were able to say, well, we actually can see that the electric and the weak interactions uh, are related to each other by some mathematics that are just too advanced for us to go into now, but we can see that they might be part of the same big scheme. And maybe we see how the strong interaction can fit in there. So we put this all together and it's called the standard model. But we still don't see how the gravitational interaction fits in there. That still seems quite different. And that bothers people a lot. We'd like to, to have a coherent package. You may hear, hear of people working on string theory, um, talking about quantum gravity. What they're trying to do is understand how to think of how to look at all these interactions in such a way that that the gravitational interaction looks like the that it's related to these and that, that they're all of one piece. Um, and that's still work in progress. No one knows if we're going to be able to do that or not, but that's one of the things physicists are trying to, trying to understand. This may sound a little abstract, but it actually these things keep coming up in the world and keep, keep having relevance to you. Contemporary physics turns out to be something that affects you and is important in daily technology. Um, an example of this actually is, is a GPS. Who's used a GPS? Yeah, I think my iPhone actually has one. Um, so we have these satellites going around the Earth, and they're broadcasting information to your GPS. Your GPS is sending information back up there. Okay, we know that it takes information a, long, a certain amount of time to travel, so we have to account for that. So that's limitation of the speed of light. That's Einstein's special relativity. But what some people were surprised by, although some physicists told them they had to pay attention, was that in fact one had to take into account general relativity. Einstein's greatest theory, the idea that all space is deformed by massive objects and therefore time runs very differently it, in, in different situations. It turns out that the clocks up in satellites run at a different speed from the clocks on Earth because we're close to this mass, closer to the massive object than the satellite is. The result of that very tiny difference turns out 
to be that if you don't take it into account, your GPS is off by many tens of kilometers in the end of one day. So all these tiny little errors. And so, in fact, I'm told that the first GPS satellites were actually sent up with a switch, a programmable switch from Earth. And the engineers didn't actually, who built it, didn't actually believe this general relativity stuff. So they said, we're not going to put that in. We're going to see what happens. And there were big errors by the end of the day, so they flipped the switch and turned the program on. They corrected for that, and it worked. So, so contemporary, contemporary physics of this kind actually turns out to be extremely important um, in, in both science and technology and the things you work with every day. So you may be, wor may be working with quantum computing within the next 20 years. Um, so it's important to understand some of the, the framework that goes on here. Okay.